Welcome back, class. Uh, this is Professor Watson. Um, uh, congratulations on surviving the midterm exam. So I'm uh, very happy for that. Um, uh, welcome back. I hope you guys have had a little bit of a break now. Um, and uh, again, this is uh, Contracts, LGLA 1351. Um, it's been a while. So let me remind you, um, we, we've spent some time talking about uh, the elements of contract, right? And, and, and uh, we talked about uh, an agreement. Uh, we talked about a uh, meeting of the minds, right? Those kind of things. We talked about uh, mutuality and consideration. And and before your midterm, we talked about the, those last couple of elements, legality and capacity, okay? So we finally got all that under our belt. Uh, this week, uh, we're moving on to chapter eight. This week, we're going to talk about uh, the famous statute of frauds. You can say it with me, statute of frauds. That moaning you heard, that was every law student ever going, oh my God, the statute of frauds. Uh, because it is uh, it is something that uh, uh, that uh, uh, legal professionals, law students, love to hate. Okay, but um, but what is the statute of frauds? Uh, the statute of frauds is uh, well, it is actually a statute, um, but it has very little to do with fraud in the way you're thinking, right? We we learned about fraud a couple of weeks ago. We learned the elements of fraud, right? Remember, uh, we learned the difference between uh, fraud and misrepresentation. Uh, the difference was uh, that intent, that intent to deceive. Um, and when we say fraud, what do we think automatically? We thought punitive damages, right? Because that's fraud. Whereas misrepresentation was kind of like fraud, but without the intent. Uh, so you could still maybe rescind a contract. You might get damages, uh, but you wouldn't get those punitive damages, those damages that make you and your lawyer rich, right? Um, that's not what we're talking about when we talk about the statute of frauds. Uh, the statute of frauds is a statute that is about preventing fraud on the court, OK, uh, the idea here is that it is it would be very easy for one party to come to court and say, Watson signed a contract with me that he was going to pay me a million dollars. And I uh, and they sue me and I come in and I go, I don't know what he's talking about. I never signed that contract. He's crazy. Um, and it'd be my word against his. Right. Um, and in a civil case, the um, uh, if you've taken um civil litigation yet, uh, you would know that the burden of proof in a case like that is only a preponderance of the evidence, slightly more likely than not, okay? So um, if a jury just doesn't have any other evidence, it's, it's your word against my word, then, then I got to be careful because, um, you know, maybe 50, maybe 49% of the time, the jury might find the other guy more credible than me, right? If it's just a he said, she said thing, um, and, um, and they can say, well, you know, Watson, you agreed to pay him a million dollars, so I guess you have to. Um, uh, but that would be a fraud on the court, right? We would all have an incentive to go down and file these fraudulent lawsuits that are just based on nothing uh, in the hopes that every once in a while we'd hit a big lick and, um, and we could get a judgment against somebody. Now, you wouldn't want to do that against me um, because I'm not rich. Um, you would want to do it against somebody who had deep pockets, right? A lot of money, a lot of assets, things you could take. Um, Elon Musk, right? You would want to go file lawsuits against Elon Musk saying, hey, he promised to give me a million dollars or uh, go file lawsuits against Bill Gates saying, hey, he promised to give me a, a million dollar, a hundred million dollars. I think he just gave away a hundred million dollars uh, to a couple of people just the other day. Wouldn't you like to have those kind of troubles? Um, uh, but those would be frauds on the court. And so that's what the statute of frauds is about. It's not about preventing fraud per se, fraud as we understood it, it's about preventing fraudulent claims being presented in court. And, and how does the law do that? Well, it says, look, um, we've talked this semester about how um, contracts could be oral or written. They could be expressed or implied. Remember all those things from even the first couple of weeks? Um, the law says, you know what, because of this potential fraud on the court, um, we're going to create a statute. It's an actual statute. Every state has one. Um, we're going to pass a statute that says there are some contracts that are just so important that if you don't put them in writing, they're not enforceable. OK, so if you if you claim Elon Musk promised to pay you ten million dollars, um, then um, that's significant enough. that That's the kind of thing that probably wouldn't be on a handshake deal. Right. Um, and if you were planning on doing it on a handshake deal, maybe you ought to go ahead and get it in writing um, because there's a certain class of contracts. Um, where the courts have decided, where, where the law, not the courts, this is a statute, remember, um, where, where the law has decided these certain kind of contracts are significant enough uh, that in order to prevent fraud on the court, we're going to require that these types of contracts be in writing or else the court's not going to enforce them, right? Doesn't mean you didn't enter into it. 
doesn't mean it wouldn't have been a perfectly valid contract otherwise. It's just that the court is not going to enforce this contract if you didn't bother to put it in writing. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so when we talk about statute of frauds, forget fraud, right? Forget those elements of fraud that we learned about a few weeks ago, because the statute of frauds is not about that kind of fraud. It's about preventing these fictitious claims to courts in contract cases where, where the law has decided these, these kind of contracts are significant enough that if it was legit, you should put it in writing. And if you don't put it in writing, then that's your problem. The courts aren't going to try to enforce those things, okay? Um, so let's take a look at our PowerPoint today. I hope you've already read chapter eight. Of course, you've got my lecture notes, but let's look at chapter eight a little more in depth and let's talk about the statute of frauds, okay? Let me see if I can get that up on the screen. Um, all right, chapter eight. Um, uh, so again, as we have discussed, uh, there are certain, and we've talked about it briefly, right? Uh, it's come up every once in a while. We've said we'll talk about that later. Uh, but um, there are certain types of contracts um, that the court simply will not enforce unless the contract is, that there, there's two requirements under the statute of frauds. Not only does it have to be in writing, but it has to be in writing and signed, okay? So the statute of frauds defines certain types of contracts, which in order to be enforceable, they must be in writing and signed, okay? Now, uh, what does your specific statute of fraud say? Well, it's a statute, and so you have to look it up. I can teach you about the statute of frauds generally, uh, but every jurisdiction, every state is going to have their own statute of frauds. Uh, so before you go writing a brief to a court, you need to look up your specific statute, right? Uh, we're going to talk about the, 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 the general uh, rules that are under almost every statute of frauds, but, uh, but let's take Texas, for example. Texas, we add a couple of extra little tweaks to it, right? Like um, uh, oil and gas leases, right? Most states don't even worry about oil and gas. But in Texas, we had a special little section about oil and gas uh, transactions, for instance, right? That's kind of a unique Texas thing. Now, but we're going to talk about uh, the general provisions of, of statute of frauds that are true in just about every state, okay? So every state has adopted at least one or more statutes. Sometimes it's more than one statute. You've got to look more than one place. In Texas, you have to look more than one place. We'll talk about that in just a second. But every state has, adapt, has adopted at least one statute that sets forth which contracts must be in writing if you want the court to enforce it, okay? Now, remember, this is just if you want the court to enforce it. The statute of fraud doesn't make any of these contracts illegal. It doesn't say you can't enter into contracts without being in writing. It doesn't say both sides can't follow through on these types of contracts if they're not in writing. It simply says um, that in order to be enforceable, these contracts must be in writing, okay? So it's nothing about making it illegal, uh, but we call these statutes statutes of fraud. Um, and again, they may be similar from state to state, but they're not exactly the same everywhere. Uh, let's take a look at the Texas statutes. The Texas statutes, um, uh, you should, uh, first of all, look at the Texas Business and Commerce Code, Chapter 26. Uh, that is Texas's general statute of frauds. Uh, but there's a second section in our old friend, the UCC, okay? So if you look at Section 2201 of the UCC, um, then uh, you'll find a, an extra little uh, part of the statute of frauds. We'll talk about that when we get to the specific elements of the statute or, or the different categories of the statute of frauds, okay? Uh, the, the one that falls in the UCC is... Uh, the second to last one, gee, goods. Uh, and where would you find a statute of frauds involving the sale of goods? Well, um, well, maybe in uh, the UCC, right? In the in 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 uh, chapter two uh, on in Texas, we call it chapter two, and in other states, that's title two of the UCC that deals with the sale of goods. Okay, uh, I've got a link uh, to both of those there for you. Uh, be careful. I just looked the other day. Uh, I mean, like just two or three days ago, and the, uh, uh, the the state may have changed that bottom one, that link to section two two hundred one of the Texas Business and Commerce Code. Uh, but if that link doesn't uh, doesn't work for you uh, at this point, you ought to be able to find. Uh, the Texas Business and Commerce Code, and you ought to be able to find Section 2201, okay? Um, before we get to the categories of contracts that are covered by the statute of frauds, let's talk about the statute of frauds itself and, and how the courts deal with it, how the courts view it, how the courts enforce it, okay? Uh, number one, uh, because the statute of frauds may tend uh, to undo what are otherwise uh, good and valid agreements, right? Contracts that the parties intended to enter into, um, but the statute of frauds may make those contracts unenforceable anyway, right? Uh, and because of that, uh, 
uh, courts, they, they generally, we say they narrowly construe the statute. What do we mean when we say they narrowly construe the statute? We mean um, that the, the, the courts usually give the statute of frauds a very literal reading, a very literal, okay? So they read it, and if this, if this particular situation, this particular, particular contract doesn't meet the exact letter of the law, then the courts aren't going to expand the statute. They're not going to find reasons to make things fit in the statute, and they're not going to find reasons to make things covered by the statute, okay? Instead, just the opposite. If they can find a reason to exclude something from the statute, in other words, if they can find a way to say, well, the statute of frauds doesn't apply to this contract, they're more likely to do that, okay? And why? Uh, and again, we call that nar a narrow construction, right? They're, they're, they're applying it in a very limited fashion. And why do they do that? Again, because the statute of frauds has a tendency um, to invalidate what are otherwise uh, uh, perfectly valid, uh, perfectly enforceable agreements if they had just been in writing, right? Contracts that the parties intended to enter into, um, and now one person is going to get lucky and say it's not enforceable because it wasn't in writing. OK, um, so uh, courts are not going to try to expand statutes of frauds. They're going to apply them very narrowly. OK, uh, second thing you need to understand, uh, if you haven't taken civil litigation yet, um, then this, this may not have occurred to you yet. or You may not even really understand it yet. But most courts will hold that the statute of frauds is an affirmative defense. OK, an affirmative defense. If you've taken um if you've taken civil litigation, you probably understand what an affirmative defense is. Uh, but if you haven't, I guess let's talk about that real quick just to make sure. Um, a, a defense is anything that you can do that prevents the plaintiff from winning, right? So if the plaintiff says, uh, you signed this contract with me and you say, no, I didn't, that's a defense. If you can prove you didn't enter into the contract, that's a defense because the, the plaintiff has to prove that you entered into an agreement. And if you can prove you didn't, that's a defense. Um, typically, the burden of proof on a defense is, is on the plaintiff, not on the defendant. It, it, it's really that the, the plaintiff has the burden of proving something and the defendant is just trying to keep them from doing that, okay? But the burden of proof is always on the plaintiff. Not so when it comes to affirmative defenses. What is an affirmative defense? Um, uh, when I teach civil litigation, I describe affirmative, uh, affirmative defenses as the yeah, but defenses, okay? Yes, plaintiff, Maybe you've proved the elements of your case, but I have an excuse, okay? Think of things like uh, a self-defense in a criminal case. That's an affirmative defense, right? The, the state comes in and proves you shot this guy and killed him, right? Um, if you say, no, I'm not the one who pulled the trigger or no, he didn't die, those are defenses. But if you say, yeah, I shot and killed him because he was shooting at me first, right? That's a yeah, but defense. Yeah, you can prove the elements of your case, but I have an excuse. That's an affirmative defense. And affirmative defenses are different than regular defenses. Those affirmative defenses or yeah, but defenses, number one, the defendant has the burden of proof on. Uh, number two, and this is important, uh, especially in your civil litigation class, affirmative defenses must be pled, okay? If you do not plead an affirmative defense, then when you get to trial, the judge is not going to let you talk about it. He's not going to let you bring it up. So, you cannot show up for trial and say, ha, 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 the plaintiff never got this uh, agreement in writing, and so it's not enforceable under the statute of frauds. So the court's going to say, well, did you plead it? Because if you didn't plead it, then you have waived your affirmative defense, okay? So that's why it's important. You need to understand that an affirmative, that, that uh, the statute of frauds, if you're going to use that as a defense to say, hey, you can't, uh, you can't enforce that contract against me because it's not in writing, then you need to plead it. How do you do that? You put it in your answer, right? When the, when the, defendant ser uh, when, when the plaintiff serves you with a petition in Texas or a complaint in, in other states or, or in federal court, um, then when you respond with your answer, you would, uh, you, you would set forth your affirmative defenses, including statute of frauds, okay? Um, so if you want to rely on the protection of the statute of frauds, you must plead it as a defense, otherwise it's waived. You also are going to have the burden of proof of proving uh, your, your defense of statute, uh, of statute of frauds, okay? Um, second, even if the statute of frauds applies, uh, be aware that our equitable remedies may still apply as well, okay? The statute of frauds says that a court cannot enforce a contract unless it's in writing. Those equitable defenses, if you remember way back when, 
those are alternatives to contract. Remember that, um, uh, that, that section of that chapter was entitled alternatives to contract. Um, um, the, the things like promissory estoppel and quantum merit, right? Or quasi-contract, your book called it. Uh, I think that's a stupid name, uh, but use it if you want to. I think quantum merit is, uh, or um, uh, um, uh, quantum merit is just much more descriptive, right? Um, uh, but, but promissory estoppel or quantum merit only apply when the contract is unenforceable, right? Promissory estoppel, remember that usually applied where, where maybe the, the missing element was consideration, uh, whereas quantum merit usually applied when maybe the missing element was an agreement. Either way, for either one of those to apply, the court has to find that there's not an enforceable contract. Well, if the court finds that it can't enforce the contract because of the statute of frauds, the court may still find uh, that it can grant remedies under promissory estoppel or quantum merit if they're appropriate, right? Now, as the plaintiff, remember that if you want to rely on quantum merit or promissory estoppel, you're going to have to plead that yourself as well, right? Maybe you plead breach of contract. And then the alternative, uh, if the other side tries to claim statute of frauds, then judge, uh, we want to plead uh, promissory estoppel or quantum merit. Remember, you're need, you'll, you'll need to prove the elements of those. Um, and if you can't remember the elements of those, go back and look at your notes from that chapter, okay? Uh, so um, some limitations on the statute of frauds right off the bat. Number one, narrowly construed um, because it can tend to invalidate otherwise perfectly good agreements. Um, that number two, it's an affirmative defense. You've got to, the defendant has to plead it and prove it. And number three, even if it applies, and this goes along with that narrow construction idea, even if the statute applies and, and the court rules, okay, this contract is not enforceable, the court may still be able to, uh, to grant remedies under these promissory estoppel or quantum merit or, or other equitable remedies, okay? Um, what, before we get to the categories of, of contracts that are covered by the statute of frauds, um, uh, what, uh, what kind of evidence will satisfy the statute of frauds? What does the statute of frauds require? Um, well, again, check your statute, right? Every state has its own statute, but in general, um, if the statute of frauds applies, then the, then, then, the, then the statute requires that the agreement must be in writing and it must be signed by the party charged, okay? So the agreement must be in writing and it must be signed by the party to be charged. What does that mean? I've also got or acknowledged uh, in parentheses. Let's talk about both of those. Well, it means that number one, um, you've got to have the terms of the agreement in some kind of written form, okay? Um, and number two, it has to be signed by the defendant, the person you're trying to enforce the contract against. Does it have to be signed by every party? Does it have to be signed by the plaintiff, for instance? No, that's not what the statute of frauds requires, right? If, if the plaintiff is going to come forward and say, hey, judge, enforce this contract, then, then by doing so, the plaintiff is acknowledging that he entered into it, right? Um, so that's not a problem. Um, but it has to be signed by the party to be charged, okay? The, the, the party you're trying to enforce the contract against. Um, so that's important to understand. A contract that, that, that would fall within the statute of frauds does not need to be signed by both parties in order to be enforceable. It just needs to be signed by the party you are trying to enforce the contract against. Uh, and then again, it says, or acknowledged in parentheses. What does that mean? That means that even if the contract wasn't in writing, even if the contract wasn't signed at the time you entered into the contract, a subsequent acknowledgement that is in writing and that is signed is enough to form, uh, is, is enough to take, we would call it taking it out of the statute of frauds. That's enough to satisfy the statute of frauds so that the statute of frauds doesn't apply, okay? Or it does apply, but it's been satisfied. So uh, let's say you and I enter into an agreement that would otherwise be covered by the statute of frauds, uh, but we don't put it in writing. And then after we enter into that agreement, um, I send you an email that says, ha, 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 I know we entered into this agreement, uh, uh, but you didn't get it in writing. So, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I know we entered into an agreement with these terms, but you didn't get it in writing. So, ha, 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 it's not enforceable. Love, Professor Watson. Well, what is that? That's an acknowledgement. I just said, I know we entered into this. I know we agreed to it. And I set out the terms and I signed it. That's enough to satisfy the statute of frauds, okay? So be careful. You can acknowledge it. That writing can be formed later. That writing can be signed later, even after the formation of the agreement. That is sufficient to satisfy the statute of frauds, 
Okay. Um, well, what kind of writing is required though? Well, the answer is just about any form of writing may do. Uh, there is no one form required. It does not need to be something that looks like it was drafted by an attorney on, uh, you know, high quality bond paper and, you know, signed in blood in front of a, a pope and, and, and three witnesses. Um, any form of writing is typically sufficient as long as it contains the terms of the agreement and as long as it is signed by the party to be charged. Um, that right, there's no requirement, again, that that writing be made at the time of the contract. It is sufficient if that uh, writing was ever made and ever signed by the party who you're trying to enforce the case against, uh, enforce the contract against, as long as it was in writing and signed or acknowledged by them, okay? Um, it is important to understand that that writing does not have to contain every single term. It doesn't have to be what we would call an integrated agreement. An integrated agreement is, is an agreement where, where every single term of the, of the contract is in the writing, right? We would call that within the four corners, right? On the paper. Um, uh, not every single term um, has to be contained in the writing. As long as the court can attain the, uh, as long as the court can ascertain the essential terms with reasonable certainty, okay? That, that, that's generally the language you see. As long as the court can ascertain the essential terms with reasonable certainty, um, then that will satisfy the statute of frauds. Um, do you remember the essential terms? Uh, typically, the essential terms are things like um, uh, uh, the uh, consideration, I'm sorry, subject matter of the contract, the consideration or the price to be paid, right? The parties and the time. Um, those are typically your essential terms. And if the court can ascertain those, it that'll satisfy the statute of frauds and the court may be able to imply other terms or might be able to hear evidence on other terms as long as those essential terms are contained within the writing, okay? Again, it does not have to be signed by every single party. It only has to be signed by the party to be charged. Um, it is important to understand that the writing doesn't even still have to exist. You don't have to be able to bring the writing to court to prove that there was a writing that, that satisfied the statute of frauds, okay? Um, that may sound crazy. Um, and, 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 and obviously, that's going to be a limited number of cases where there was a writing, and you can prove that there was a writing, but there is no writing anymore. Uh, but if you can, that will, stat that will satisfy the statute of frauds. So um, if, uh, if, if we sign a contract, and uh, I make a, and I send you a draft of a contract, you sign it, I sign it, um, and then you tear it up and burn it, destroy it, right? Um, do we have a writing? Well, um, I don't have one that is signed by you, but I can still print out a copy off of my work processor. And if I can prove to the court that, yes, you did sign this, but then you destroyed the original or, or it was just lost, whatever. As long as I can prove that this is the writing or this was the writing and you did sign it, uh, then that contract uh, that will satisfy the statute of frauds. The, 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 the fact that there had at one time been a writing that was signed that would, sta that would satisfy the statute of frauds is sufficient, okay? Um, does the writing have to be a physical writing? No, um, especially these days, that's becoming more and more important, right? It just has to be in writing. So an electronic writing may be sufficient, okay? So a, a text or, you know, an Instagram message, uh, that, that may be sufficient, an email, right? That, uh, that it may be sufficient to satisfy the statute of frauds as long as it was signed. Uh, so if you send me an email or you send me a text or you send me a tweet even, um, it is amazing how much business these days is done by things like uh, uh, Twitter and Facebook um, and uh, even big, important you know, million dollar contracts uh, may be done by, by Twitter and, and Facebook and instant messaging and that kind of stuff. And, and if the, the essential terms are in that writing, and if the court can determine that that writing was signed by the party you want to charge, um, uh, you want to enforce the contract against, then that may satisfy the statute of frauds. Um, okay, but, but how do you sign a text or how do you sign an email? Is it, does it have to be a handwritten, you know, John Hancock? Um, no. Uh, there's a lot of law on that. Any form of a signature may be enough, okay? Signatures, uh, definitely enough, right? But initials may be enough. An electronic signature may be enough. So if you send somebody an email and your email program will automatically put your signature block on the bottom, that may be enough. Um, even a stamp, if you uh, have a secretary that rubber stamps, you know, your signature on things, that may be enough. Um, 
Uh, there have even been some cases that have gone as far to say that something sent on letterhead is enough of a signature, that that letterhead at the top um, is, is enough to be a signature. Now, um, in those cases, at least in the ones that I'm aware of, that wasn't just, um, you know, something that you created on your word processor and email to somebody that was actually printed letterhead, right? Where it came from a printer, it's embossed, you know, there, there's letterhead at the top. Um, but, but there have been cases that have said that even letterhead at the top is, um, is uh, uh, sufficient um, uh, to constitute a signature that would satisfy um, the statute of frauds. Um, there's a whole there's a whole body of other laws that, that, that govern what can be a signature. We have the, the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act um, uh, that governs uh, um, these days. Uh, what, what is a signature? What can be a signature on things, even, behind con even besides contracts? Um, and it, it can be pretty broad. Anything that you intended to be a signature um, might be enough to satisfy the statute of frauds. And it's going to be up to the court to determine, was that intended to be a signature? Um, um, and may, may, may be up to a jury. And that may turn on, does the court want to enforce the contract or not, right? So, so you got to be very careful uh, when you're sending writings to people um, about whether or not this actually constitutes an agreement, whether it's a writing, okay? Uh, if you're trying to make sure that you're outside the statute of frauds. Um, let me point out one more thing. I don't think it's on the list here. Um, the writing can actually consist of more than one writing. OK, um, it may be a, a string of 25 different texts. Right. Sometimes that's the way that's the way negotiations are done. Right. We do. We we negotiate this issue and then we negotiate that issue and then we negotiate this issue and then we negotiate another issue. And 25, 30 issues later, we say, OK, I think we've got an agreement on everything. We've got a deal. Right. Well, even if that's a string of 100 different texts or emails, as long as they're all in writing, as long as the court can can determine the essential terms from that group of writings, and as long as those writings are are signed, or, or there's something that the court can um, uh, can presume was a signature by the by, by the defendant by the party you're trying to enforce the contract against, um, that uh, that that string of writings may be enough. Um, so they don't have to be on paper. They don't have to be physical. The writing can be electronic. Um, it doesn't have to be in any special form. It can be on a cocktail napkin. Right, written uh, written with a, a pen on the back of a cocktail napkin, that can be sufficient to satisfy the statute of frauds. Doesn't even have to exist at the time the contract was entered into, but there has to be a writing. If a contract would fall within the statute of frauds, then there has to be some writing that contains at least the essential terms, uh, some writing or group of writings um, that, that contain at least the essential terms of the contract uh, that has been signed by the party you're trying to enforce the contract against. OK, um, again, that signature issue, um, it can be pretty broad. Um, don't think that you can get away with signing a contract, Donald Duck, and then acting like you have a contract. Um, and then when things don't go your way, going, ha ha ha, you can't enforce it against me because I didn't sign my name. I signed it, Donald Duck. Um, the courts are going to look at that and go, well, you signed it, right? You intended that to be your signature. Um, so they're going to charge you with that. You know, you, you intended the other side uh, to accept that as your signature. Um, what if you've had a stroke or what if you're disabled? All you can do is mark an X. Um, that's going to be a sufficient signature. Uh, but when it comes to things like contracts in cyberspace, um, believe it or not, this is still a new issue. Right? Sure, we've been uh, forming contracts by email for decades now, uh, but it is still a relatively new area. And so you have things like the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, um, again, that's another one of those, you know, quote unquote uniform laws. Uh, so it's not exactly the same in every state, uh, but uh, they're pretty close, pretty similar usually. And you can find Texas's version in chapter 322 of the Texas Business and Commerce Code. Uh, there's the, the, the 2000 electric, uh, Electronic Signatures and Global and National Commerce Act. Uh, that's a federal law. You'll find it at 15 U.S.C. 7031. Uh, that only applies to contracts that are in interstate commerce. Um, in, in other words, that they have to touch commerce between, in, in, between states and parties in different states um, for the federal act to apply. Um, but, but both of those uh, uh, statutes have to do with how do we sign things in cyberspace? What can be considered a signature in, in an electronic tra transaction, in, 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 a, in a transaction that was formed electronically? So um, 
So if you try to enter into a contract with somebody electronically, either one of those statutes may apply. Um, if you're going to go, um, if you're going to go get a new cell phone from AT and T, right? You do that all from your computer online. Uniform Electronic Transactions Act is going to apply. Uh, so is the uh, Electronic Signatures in Global and National Commerce, uh, because AT and T undoubtedly. Uh, is moving that across state lines, okay? Uh, the point there is you don't need to memorize either one of those statutes. I want you to have them and be familiar with them in case you ever um, get a case that involves an electronic signature, because if you do, then you need to know those statutes exist and you need to go find them because they're going to be very important to your case on what constitutes a signature. So you've got those resources there. Um, the big picture here, though, is be aware contracts in cyberspace, electronic contracts, that is a rapidly evolving, a rapidly changing area of the law. Um, so even if you memorize the uh, Uniform Electronic Transactions Act today, it may be different tomorrow. Or even if the law was the same tomorrow, who knows what electronic transactions look like tomorrow? Um, maybe uh, uh, when I talk about email, my uh, half of my students roll their eyes. So they say, nobody emails anymore, you old dinosaur. You know, we all use tweets and Instagram and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, maybe, uh, you know, next week, the next generation is going to be looking at you guys going, well, tweets and Instagram, that is so yesterday. Now we use, you know, God knows what. So, um, so be aware, it's a rapidly changing area of the law. There's at least two statutes that you can use if you ever have one of those cases come up and you need to start researching what constitutes an, electric, uh, an electronic signature um, in order to satisfy the statute of frauds. Um, those, uh, I can't give you a few details about those, um, um, those electronic signatures act. Um, generally, they, um, they require consent. They require that the, the, that the parties agree to conduct the transaction by email. Um, what does that mean? It means that the, um, the court is going to look at, did both parties engage in this way that it looked like they intended um, to, uh, uh, to, to construct this agreement or, or to conduct this transaction by electronic means. Uh, and if so, then the court may even infer intent. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, but generally it requires a finding by the court that both of the parties intended uh, to, to conduct the transaction by electronic means. Uh, but again, that can be implied and so be very careful um, of things like uh, click wrap agreements. Uh, your book mentions click wrap agreements. What is a click wrap agreement? Uh, well, the, you're familiar with click agreements, right? Those are the ones that you've entered into when you, uh, when you ordered a new cell phone from AT&T online, right? Or, or anything else. And there was that box that said, by clicking here, you've agreed to the following terms and, and, and conditions. Um, and uh, did they list them all? No, you got to click on that link. Um, did you click on that link? No, you did not. Don't lie. Uh, we all know you didn't. But they were there, and you could have, and you should have. And even those few times where you did, you looked at it, and it was 47 pages long, and you went, oh, well, never mind. I'm not going to read this. And you went back, and you just clicked the box, right? Um, well, uh, you had a chance to read those. And when you clicked the box, you agreed to those terms. So be careful of those. Uh, what do we mean by a click wrap agreement? Um, truthfully, you all may be a little young now, uh, depending on how old you are, to remember the wrap agreements. Uh, they are... Um, we don't see them as much anymore because we don't buy software in the store much anymore, right? Now we just download everything. In fact, we don't even buy software anymore. Now we just rent software, right? Everything is a subscription agreement. Um, but it used to be if you went over to, you know, Best Buy or the computer center to buy a new copy of, uh, you know, Word um, or PowerPoint, um, the, uh, the software would be on a, disc, on a disc that was in a box. That box would be wrapped in plastic. And under that plastic, between the plastic and the box, was going to be this piece of paper that said, by opening the plastic, you have agreed to these terms, right? So there was a plastic wrap around the box, and there were terms right there underneath the plastic that said, if you open this plastic, you've agreed to these terms. And if you don't agree to these terms, then don't open the plastic and go return the software. Um, that was kind of the... The, the predecessor of these click agreements, right? The click here to agree to these terms. Well, that was open the plastic to agree to these terms. Um, so we call those click wrap agreements. And even if, um, even if the parties don't read them, uh, they are oftentimes enforceable, okay? Because you clicked or you opened um, and you didn't have to because you just wanted that cell phone or you just wanted that uh, software, et cetera. Uh, you opened it um, and you may have consented. You may have then subjected yourself to whatever those additional agreements are. We would call that a click wrap agreement.
let's get back to the statute of frauds, though. Um, uh, and uh, I guess maybe one more one more slide on these uh, uh, on these uh, contracts in cyberspace. Um, those um, Uniform Electronic Transactions Act or the um, uh, the, the Federal Act, uh, they typically require um, some sort of a records retention process, right? As you can imagine, with those uh, click wrap agreements, it's really easy to say, well, they clicked here and they agreed to everything. How do we know what you're saying the contract is now is actually what would have popped up on the screen if I had clicked read the terms and conditions, right? Or um, how do we know that what you're showing now is really what did pop up on the screen when I clicked, um, you know, those terms and conditions, right? How do we prove that? Um, you know, most people, even if you did click on the terms and conditions, even if you did read them all, most people don't print those out or they don't save them. They don't download them to their computer and save them. Um, so when AT&T comes and says, well, hey, you know, you agreed to give us your firstborn child when you clicked on this. Um, how do you prove whether or not that was really the agreement? You know, when, when this agreement never existed, right? You didn't click on it. And so it never even, it was never put on paper. It was never even put on a screen. Um, how do we know what you agreed to or what you, what you would have been agreeing to? Well, um, there's typically some, some fairly intensive records retention uh, um, policies in both of those statutes about how will the, the person trying to enforce the contract prove what those terms were. Um, so those record retention uh, um, uh, provisions are very important uh, so that they can prove, yes, these were the terms at the time, this is what the person agreed to, or this is what the other person would have read had they clicked the box, right? Um, some states even have laws that go farther. Uh, besides the retention requirements, uh, some states may have extra notice provisions, um, uh, those kind of things. Um, but uh, again, those are things that you probably don't need to memorize for this chapter, not necessarily things that I'm going to test you on. Um, but those are some things that, uh, that are becoming more important these days uh, and more and more important for you when you get into practice because a lot of times we don't have written contracts anymore, right? At least not written on paper. They're written on computer. They're signed on computer. Um, they're electronic. And, you know, we never see an actual physical uh, copy of the contract or physical writing. So be aware of that stuff, okay? Um, I said one more slide on uh, cyber contracts. Uh, let me take 30 more seconds. Uh, be aware that there are certain groups that have uh, power to kind of almost create their own rules and their own regulations, right? Like government entities. Um, uh, many government entities, some businesses as well, but if you're going to do business with them, they may have extra standards that go beyond the law, okay? Um, that doesn't necessarily make those contracts uh, more or less enforceable, um, but if you have kind of agreed to their rules um, in, in some other contract, then you may need to follow their additional requirements. Right. So as you can imagine, um, when, when you're contracting with the government, they have all kinds of extra requirements that they can put in, that, that they do put into contracts. The, the, the bigger, the, the more expensive, the more important the contract is, the more of those kinds of things you get in there. Right. Um, if you're just selling some local, uh, you know, some local DA's office of box pins, not a bunch of extra stuff there. Right. But if you're selling a billion dollars worth of aircraft parts to the military, it's going to be all kinds of extra requirements, extra retention document retention requirements, those kind of things that they're going to have in their, in their rules about contracts. So be sure you're aware of those if you're ever, uh, if you're ever contracting with an entity like that. There's other entities like, uh, um, that are, they're non-government entities, Walmart, for instance, right? Walmart, um, they've got so much market power um, that they've kind of got their own rules for, for how some of their contracts are handled. Um, and so if you're going to contract with Walmart, uh, be aware of some of those kind of things, okay? Um, also be aware that there's lots of businesses that are springing up to enable and assist this, right? Things like um, Adobe, right? That's that's where Adobe originally came from. It came from this desire to be able to publish documents across multiple formats so that if I sent a, a contract or something, it looked the same on your computer as it did on my computer. Um, and then quickly Adobe started uh, getting the ability to like sign things, right? To sign and to verify signatures, um, you also see things like uh, DocuSign, right? That's another company. If you've ever closed on a house, right? You, you may have written the contract with your agent on their tablet, um, and you may have used DocuSign, you know, to sign those contracts. Um, other e-signature companies like DocuSign exist. Those are all ways to, uh, to verify and confirm uh, that somebody actually signed a document uh, 
or, or actually signed an electronic document um, so that you can enforce the contract against them, but also so that you can satisfy the statute of frauds requirement for a writing. All right. Okay, so that's some preliminary stuff on the statute of frauds. Um, let's talk about the categories of um, uh, the categories of contracts that are actually covered by the statute of frauds. Uh, your book gives you the mnemonic device, my legs, okay, my legs, M-Y-L-E-G-S. Each one of those stands for a different category of contracts that are covered by the statute of frauds. Um, and I tell you what, um, let's cut this off right here. And we'll start on the categories that are covered by the statute of frauds in our second video for chapter eight, okay? I'll see you there. Thanks.